Good evening uh, to one and all. Welcome back to Harvard Hillel and our online speaker series. This is the first session that we're having in the spring semester. I think many of us were hoping that things would quiet down uh, on campus. Alas, that hasn't been the case. Um, and this semester, we do hope to have uh, a slightly wider variety of programs than we had last semester, which was really focused entirely on um, the events of October 7th and their aftermath and impact on campus. Um, but of course, we will also have programs that do directly relate to what's been going on on campus. Uh, and we're gonna kick things off this evening uh, with just such a program. This evening, we have the uh, real honor of hosting Sigal Ben Parat, who is the MRMJJ University Professor of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, where she's also a member of the philosophy and the political science departments and the faculty director of the SNF Padilla Program for Civic Dialogue. She received her doctorate in political philosophy from Tel Aviv University and was a fellow at Princeton University's Center for Human Values, the Institute for Advanced Studies, Tel Aviv University's Safra Center for Ethics, and the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Ethics here at Harvard University, which is also a co-sponsor of this evening's program. Her recent books include Cancel Wars, and free speech on campus, as well as making up our mind. She chaired Penn's Committee on Open Expression from 2015 to 2019, and serves on the boards of the Teachers Institute of Philadelphia, Middlebury's Conflict Transformation Center, and Penn's Project for Philosophy for the Young. In the past decade, she has been offering guidance to the college campuses on policy development and responses to controversies surrounding speech. Sigal, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And we do as well. I'd also like to thank this evening's sponsors, Harris and Donna Friedis, who have been enthusiastic and longtime listeners to our programs and the proud parents to two recent alumni and one current HLS student. I'd also like to thank a dear old friend, Sim Gross, who is a colleague of Sigal's at Penn, and who made this introduction. For those of you who are new to this program or just need a reminder, there is a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question, you can click there and type it in. Uh, you have an option of doing so anonymously. Don't do that. Uh, we wanna know who you are because uh, if we select your question, we will invite you up to turn on your audio and your video, and you can ask your question later this evening directly to Seagal. Uh, but Sigal, I, I really want to get started with you. I have a lot of questions of my own. And before we get to more recent events, um, can you describe how in both practice and ideally free speech functions on campus? Yeah, so thank you for that. That's a broad question. So I'll try to answer in general terms. Um, broadly speaking, universities are tasked with or are committed to um, developing knowledge and uh, disseminating it, right? So our role is really to explore new areas of uh, truth or knowledge or research, and then to teach and, and learn about it. And to, of course, uh, make it available for uh, the public for, you know, to the public for its uses. And um, free speech is essential to this work because we really need to be able to um, air different ideas, different opinions, different perspectives, diverse questions and answers so that we can have a an atmosphere of free inquiry. And, you know, there are various laws that protect that, the First Amendment, starting with that, and then we have various other uh, um regulations and case law and um, other uh, structures that protect that, including academic freedom, which is really meant to protect our capacity as especially researchers and instructors to do our work without pressure. Um, we how it this is sort of like in, in the grand level, right at the it's sort of like at the from a bird's eye view, so to speak. But uh, in reality, 
uh, some of the push and pull that we have around the boundaries of open expression on campus have to do with the fact that uh, sometimes it's not 100% clear uh, what the boundaries are in terms of what universities can limit or what universities should allow. And these are two different questions that are oftentimes, you know, under debate and under consideration and are being litigated and uh, cause all sorts of trouble for campuses, especially in uh, the last decade or so and in different ways prior to that, when campuses are trying to restrict speech that they see as um, contradictory to or undermining their mission as universities, right? And then we get into these disagreements over what you are allowed to restrict um, and, and what you must protect. And so the boundaries are oftentimes uh, under discussion even as um, the overall legal structure and the overall reason for protecting speech on campus is fairly stable. Can you elaborate a little more on what the mission of a university is and sort of how free speech plays into that? Yeah, great. So, you know, in a democracy, uh, we protect free speech. The First Amendment protects it, uh, again, in a fairly stable way, because at a univer at, at a in a democracy, what you're looking to do is you're looking to have an open marketplace of ideas, but you are primarily looking to reflect the dignity and equality of all members of your society. They can voice their views. They can... Um, uh, exchange perspectives, they can speak in a fairly free-flowing way, uh, which is really at the heart of the democratic process. In universities, it's a little bit different, right? Because in universities, what we're trying to do is we are trying to assess uh, the quality of what you say for the purpose of developing knowledge, right? So for example, if uh, in a, in you know American democracy, we have a legal organization called the Flat Earth Society. It's a group of people who are committed to advancing the notion that the Earth is indeed flat, and that's fine. It's, they can have their voice be heard, and they can disseminate or try to recruit other people to their ranks. At the university, there is no room for this. Uh, uh, organizations' views, not because um, uh, we are sensorial or we are trying to restrict, because we find this to be an uninteresting question that has already been solved. And so we don't need to entertain or exchange uh, perspectives with people who subscribe to this mission, right? So given that our mission as a university is to differentiate what is true from what is false. We are trying to advance true knowledge and we are trying to disseminate this knowledge that we develop and that we continuously reassess and evaluate and you know, debate with each other, et cetera. Uh, we are trying to do that based on the quality of speech. Now, again, I'm saying it's sort of in a, in a broad way. Obviously, uh, we can disagree regularly on what qualifies as quality speech, but our goal is distinct from that of the public sphere, right? We are trying to learn uh, more about the world, about society, about, you know, whatever the issues that are uh, at the heart of our discipline or our research. And we are trying to disseminate this knowledge to others, uh, first off to our students, and then more broadly, you know, through publication, through talks, through various other avenues to other people. And so really um, uh, it's fairly uncontroversial as a statement that our speech is more restricted in the domain of uh, uh, the quality of the knowledge that we develop and uh, evaluate and disseminate, right? If I can't publish an article in a um, 
uh, you know, high-ranking journal, it's not necessarily because I'm censored. Maybe the article is not good enough, right? Or not interesting enough or innovative enough, right? So we, um, my speech is restricted, but I have no complaint. My rights have not been infringed. I, in my view, universities do similar things in regard to making sure that their knowledge is accessible to everyone, that their community members, faculty and students and staff in a different way are able to participate in the process of uh, developing and disseminating knowledge. And this also entails some similar boundaries that we can create for ourselves in order to advance our mission. So it really sounds like there's one primary value, and that is seeking knowledge. And I know you, you mentioned this question of dignity, but I think that was outside of, of the context right. of the campus. Um, so how would you respond to you know someone who feels as if their dignity is in fact infringed upon uh, by some kind of speech that exists on campus. Um, I mean, let's just say the example you gave for someone who's a flat earther and that's very core to their identity and they feel like it's been dismissed as something that's not even an idea that should be entertained at all, uh, but that feels like that infringes upon their identity uh, or and therefore their dignity. How do you sort of, how, how do you think about that particular challenge? Right. So this is a, a typical challenge. I mean, flat earth, of course, is just a sort of like a uh, example that can grab your imagination. But we do see this kind of challenge regularly uh, with all sorts of identities and commitments and values and beliefs and perspectives. Um, and I think, again, this is part of the work that we do is try to focus on the kind of questions that we want to ask, the evidence that we want to marshal in order to answer these questions, and um, the answers that are acceptable according to our guidelines, right? And if people find that their um, uh, identity is dismissed or an aspect of their identity is dismissed or that their uh, values, beliefs, perspectives are uh, not uh, provided proper hearing, uh, of course, they do have ways to try and get their voice across, but it does still make sense for the university. And I'm saying university is a sort of like general term, you know, I can say in my classroom, the fact that something was revealed to you in a dream is not proper evidence for the paper that you are writing in my class, right? I need a different type of argumentation. It's fine if you tell me that it was revealed to you in a dream, but I need other different kinds of evidence for my paper. And similarly for other types of speech, whether it's comments in class or whether it's a publication or whether it's your syllabus or whatever it might be, we can have both norms and um, uh, guidance around what is acceptable. Now, obviously, again, a university is a big place, you know, at Harvard, like at Penn, a lot of students are um are a, in part of the residential college system, right? And so, it's also somebody's home. It's a lot of people's home. There's going to be different guidance for what is permissible in your house, even if it's part of the university, versus what is permissible in the lab or in class. So the, the, the reason that the university exists is not to provide you with a home. It's to advance knowledge, so that's the core mission. But a university has to acknowledge that it serves all sorts of other purposes, and so uh, it aligns its uh, expectations and norms, including norms around speech, to the context in which the speech is made. So I have some questions about the different roles that the university plays and how that's been playing out, especially since October 7th, but just to remain sort of still at a, a higher, more theoretical level. Um, you know, you, you touch on this this really notion of epistemology and sort of how we get to truth. Um, and I think a, a big challenge in our broader society is that, and I think you refer to this as truth decay in one of your books, right? That I don't think there's, you know, certainly across the American population, I don't really think there's a consensus 
on epistemology and sort of how we go about establishing truth. And within the university system, who is meant to kind of be setting the bounds of what constitutes legitimate evidence and what doesn't? So, you know, you gave this example of, I saw something in a dream, which you can imagine some cultures that actually could be of uh, a pretty supreme epistemology. Who's making those decisions? Who should be making those decisions? Um, and how does that sort of evolve over time? Great. So definitely, uh, in, we are uh, currently in a moment that, um, you know, you can refer to, and it's not my term, but I definitely relate to it, truth decay uh, or post-truth, some people say. Um, or you can think about it as the democratization of knowledge, right? People have access to loads of information and facts and um uh, the ability to do their own research. I mean, uh, so uh, the uh, the opportunity to engage yourself, to invest your time into trying to find your own understanding based on um, available materials is, you know, it's good and bad, right? It's good and bad because you have more power as an individual person. You don't need to pay tuition in order to engage in some of these efforts, but also it means that we have a much harder time uh, assessing what is true or false, what is, um, uh, you know, a high quality argument versus some nonsense, right? Especially when, this, the, when, when the stream of comments and uh, perspectives is ongoing. Um, and I would say that uh, the challenge that it poses for us is the amount of available information and its democratization. And it's also the fact that is problematic both for the university and for democratic society overall, as well as non-democratic societies in different ways, that um, uh, we live in sort of our own echo chambers, right? And we uh, tend to really seek information and be exposed to information that validates our prior beliefs, right? And so things may seem to us, and I think that's fairly evident after October 7th, um, that people have very different pictures of the world, of what is actually happening because of their sources of information. So I would just, again, at the, at the broader level, I would say that uh, the responsibility for assessing um, the quality of arguments at, at the university or in the higher education sector is really placed on the various disciplines where research is happening, right? So, you know, uh, psychology can decide what qualifies as a proper evidence within their boundaries. And history will tell you how the history as a discipline, right? The professional organizations, professors, other people within, you know, this disciplinary structure will tell you how do you search in the archive and what qualifies as a new finding in this domain or a new argument, et cetera. So the disciplinary structure as well as some interdisciplinary structures or cross-disciplinary structures, allow you to both um, uh, uh, reach some agreement on evidentiary practices, right? Does a dream qualify? Does, uh, you know, a picture qualify? Does um, a, an argument about the flat earth merit a consideration, et cetera? Um, so broadly speaking, this is where it's happening. And this is also where you can have disagreements, right? So if you think uh, like a lot of people do right now, increasingly, that a person's experience, lived experience, should be admissible as a um, at least one aspect of the evidence that they provide to make an argument, you know, then we can discuss it as a discipline if you're in sociology or if you are in English literature or wherever you might be studying. And that you can um, relate to that uh, depending on the agreement about evidentiary practice. So a lot of that to me, I can kind of grasp when it comes to um, you know, pursuing truth within the discipline, say in publishing in journals or in terms of coursework that someone submits. But I'm curious on a college campus, so much of what stirs a lot of controversy, especially in the past couple of months, has been less about what a student is writing or even saying, 
in a classroom and much more about what is happening sort of physically on the ground outside of the classroom. So, you know, how do you think about free speech there when there's a, a protest happening on campus uh, or even say, you know, an opinion piece in a student newspaper uh, or for instance, and, and these were have been exceptionally problematic, right, you know, on side chat, which is anonymous, but you have to be part of the university to say something. And there might be procedural issues there of how to deal with them. But I'm just curious, sort of, how do you think of free speech in those contexts? Great. So the reason that speech is protected outside the classroom uh, is doesn't have as much to do with the effort to cultivate, you know, produce and disseminate knowledge. It has to do with the secondary uh, but still very important purpose of the university, which is to prepare people for their social roles, right? So to prepare people for, you know, to prepare students for their civic roles, their democratic roles, their leadership roles. So um, the reason that we are supporting um, as a university, student clubs and groups and student events, and the reason that we are protecting uh, protests or other forms of engagement on campus teachings, you know, partly it has to do with the fact that the students are citizens and they have their First Amendment rights and they can organize, they can mobilize, they can talk to each other. I mean, uh, they are protected as citizens, uh, even when they are within the bounds of a private university like Harvard, which is not committed to, uh, um, is not uh, necessarily committed to uh, the guidance of the First Amendment, even as Harvard, like other private universities, uh, uh, subscribes itself to this commitment uh, through its policies. Um, you know, it's something that nominally you could change, but I think it's inadvisable for, for the reasons that we're talking about. And so the students are protected as citizens. They are also protected as members of our campus community because uh, through our commitment to preparing people for their social and civic roles, we are encouraging them, you know, to voice their views, to express their opinions, to engage with each other, to listen to diverse perspectives. And uh, uh, if we were to say, well, as by the way, some campuses do say, protests are only allowed between 12 and one in this location with two weeks prior notice. It's not unheard of today, uh, you know, in, in the higher education sector. And so, uh, it's possible, it's legal at a private university, it's permissible, but I do think it's very restrictive, right? So on one hand, it would allow you to say, well, I'm um, neutral about the content of speech. I'm not uh, supporting pro-Israel protests, but then uh, forbidding pro-Palestinian protests. I'm actually uh, making sure that everyone can protest regardless of the topic of their uh, march or, or 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 teaching or whatever it might be, but they can only do it under these uh, guidelines. I think um, uh, very restrictive guidelines are problematic, but when we have the open and free flowing environment at Harvard Yard or on you know the College Green anywhere, uh, what happens is that you run into a lot of uh, difficulties in the disagreement and uh, a sense of um, uh, you know harms to your dignity or concerns for your personal safety or uh, other similar uh, issues that we've been seeing increasingly uh, on your and my and many other campuses. I think um, there are two, I, should I say what I think, uh, how we should think about this? Because like that's Please. basically what I've been thinking about for months now. Um, uh, whenever I can, right? Whenever I have the space for that with everything that's happening, um, my sense is that first, we, we, we need to do two things. One is to clarify our norms and our boundaries, right? So as institutions, we can have expectations about the boundaries of speech. And um, particularly as private institutions, it's easier to say, this is allowed and this is not allowed. Or 
we are rejecting this and we are endorsing this. And you do it with the endless stream of statements, but you can also more effectively do it by setting norms and you know responding to whoever crosses your boundaries. Um, and I think that, you know, in this regard, if you ask me now, I have per personally, not necessarily professionally, but as a person, me, I have different boundaries today than I had on October 6th, right? Things that I heard last year and I hear now, they hit me differently, right? Does it mean that they have to be they really do. So this is a personal sort of like testament, right? This, this is because of you being Israeli, is that what you mean? Because I'm Israeli, because of the loss and the grief and the um, concern for my family and, um, uh, you know, because uh, when I, you know, as in the past, as a free speech scholar, I defended individual people who were chanting, for example, from the river to the sea. And I thought, look, you know, this is a political statement. I'm not uh, aligned with it, but I think people should be allowed to express their views. It does hit me differently when it is chanted in October or November. But then the question that we need to ask is, and the question that I ask both as an Israeli and Jewish person who is hearing these chants on my campus, and as a person who cares about free speech and inclusion and their intersection, the question I'm asking is, how do we decide what are people allowed to say? And I think um, uh, uh, it's um, more reasonable to set norms, including punitive norms, right? But though uh, that, that have to do with, for example, advocating for genocide or, you know, um, making statements that support violence against groups based on their identity, um, I think those can permissibly be rejected from a college campus. But I think that uh, banning specific phrases, like the example I just gave, is first of all, uh, most likely unconstitutional, as we've learned from about a decade or two of litigation about speech codes, you know, like uh, um, uh, declaring a certain word or a set of words as impermissible doesn't, um, the courts don't permit us to do that, even as private institutions. But um, uh, moreover, it's very ineffective. You know, you bend this word, people change one letter or they figure out a synonym. I mean, it's like an endless chase after the next word. So I think what's really important is that universities stand for a certain set of norms that is based on the notion that whoever is a member of your campus community needs to be affirmed as an equal member who belongs there and who can speak and who can contribute to the campus community. And uh, this is impossible to do if you feel uh, consistently under attack or consistently rejected or consistently seen as unequal in various ways. So, so the one thing is to set the norms and the other thing is really to be able to differentiate the different responses that we have to these difficult moments, right? When I walk down, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, when I walk around campus and I hear people chanting, what does it do to me, right? I'm definitely feeling upset by it, right? I'm saying me personally, I feel upset when I hear these chants. Am I unsafe? I don't think I'm unsafe based on these words, right? They don't make me unsafe. Um, so, you know, so we need to be able to sort of like parse out the different emotional responses and to respond to them as a campus. What do I need because of being upset? I need to walk away, you know, I need to maybe talk to these people and explain to them. I, so they're very, you know, and maybe sometimes when they act inappropriately, they need to be, um, you know, reprimanded or otherwise, you know, um, uh, considered by the university as somebody who crossed the boundary. I think a question for me, though, is this question of safety. 
to me could be a pretty high bar right for someone to really feel actively threatened um but well before then someone could feel like i just don't belong here i don't i don't want to be here and not just because someone's hypersensitive but simply why would i subject myself to such an atmosphere of hostility and i'm curious how you think the university should balance that and also i guess the question is how much should it actually take into account when not only someone says i really feel like i'm not sure i belong here but actually then decides i don't want to come so you know a question would be how much should a place like Penn or Harvard be thinking about what's the applicant pool this year compared to previous years of Israeli or Jewish students? Right. Well, I think, you know, the, the admissions issue is its own sort of like big question. Um, and that has to do, so I just want to say very briefly, uh, the sort of like intersection of the circumstance that you just now described in regards to Israeli, but most generally um, uh, Jewish applicants to various universities, including both of ours. Um, but this intersects with this moment that is post SFFA, right? Post affirmative action decision last summer. A lot of the discussion that we've had in the last few years and before the affirmative or race conscious admissions decision uh, that came down from the Supreme Court last summer, um, we've been discussing for uh, a very long time in America and definitely more intensely in the last three years, um, the the same question that you asked in regards to Black and African-American students, right? What do you do when they feel that they don't, students and faculty, I would say, what do you do when they feel that they don't belong? What do you do when they feel that they are uh, not treated with dignity, that their voices are not heard? And we've thought a lot about this as institutions, right? And we have a toolkit to respond to that, right? I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's working uh, um, marvelously. And definitely it's being put to the test now with uh, the changes in admissions practices um, at various universities, including yours. And I think uh, uh, nationally in terms of race conscious admissions, but uh, we know that we need to take a proactive stance Right. We know that we need to support students organizing and mobilizing around their identity groups. We know that we need to represent diverse voices through speaker series, through courses that we offer, through uh, making sure that uh, the faculty reflects uh, in various ways the student body. And so we know all of these things and we know how to enact them. Uh, of course, with Jews, uh, as compared to Black or African American applicants and and students, we don't have the same uh, concern regarding representation, at least you know, as we are now. Uh, so if we are not Jews, we are Jews are not underrepresented among the faculty or the students at Harvard or at Penn or um, uh, in a lot of other universities and in the sector overall. Right. I'm saying that in comparison to uh, the more limited opportunities historically and today that we've seen for Black and African American students and faculty. So um, the, the effort is not so much around representation. It's about inclusion. It's about how do you make sure that people know that they belong? And, you know, if they don't apply, Right. So then you really can only just do it through the curriculum, right, or through statements. But when they are members of your community, when they are your students or, you know, other parts of your community, then there are actions that you need to take to reflect that you care about them, that you support them, that you want to hear their voices. You include them in your processes and practices. You make decisions with their voice in the room, you know, um, And I think, again, uh, all of this was more kumbaya, right? I mean, it was more like on the positive, dialogic, inclusionary side. But it also includes um, a commitment to reject, which doesn't necessarily mean sponsor, but it does mean reject through your policies and practices and norms and uh, um, 
uh, various tools that you have available to you to reject speech that undermines that. So I, I want to make one comment and then a follow up question. Just and the comment is the question of sort of uh, you know does representation of Jewish students on campus match the distribution of Jews you know within broader American society? Uh, I understand that point sort of theoretically, but I think one could also argue and say you know the the population of Jewish students at a place like Penn or Harvard has declined seriously in the last uh, couple of decades. And you know if the Jewish community at Harvard were only two percent. Uh, it might be nearly impossible for Jewish students to feel like they have a critical mass to be able to speak out. And if, you know, questions of, um, of anti-Semitism are really present on campus, then there may actually be a need for Jews to be overrepresented. I just think that that is an argument that, that one could offer. Um, but I guess a, a question, though, more towards, uh, you know, following up on what you've just shared, what are some steps that you've either seen or you think the university should take to make Jewish students who are feeling... Uh, you know, at the very least uncomfortable, but feeling a sense of hostility and also I'd say Israeli students, what are some steps do you think that could be taken to, uh, or that you've seen taken um, that could help uh, ameliorate that? Great. So uh, a brief response to your comments. I'm definitely not advocating um, numerical representation Right. So that's not the direction I was trying to go at all. I think some of the decline that we are seeing um, has to do with the fact that more institutions are open to Jewish students and some is for other reasons. Right. But I think, you know, Penn uh, uh, invited and welcomed uh, Jewish students fairly early on, it didn't have quotas, et cetera. And so we had a very significant proportion of Jewish students historically, and we have a significantly lower uh, proportion of self-identified Jewish students uh, now. And I think they're this year, I don't know about next year, we'll see, but this year, uh, that's what I can say. Uh, and over the past few years um, or a couple of decades, the reasons are complex and some of them have to do with the ability to apply and be admitted and feel comfortable in other places as well. So, which I welcome and value, right? So, uh, so I think, you know, the discussion of representation is complex, but I just want to be uh, clear that I wasn't a, a advocating for um, quotas or numeric representation, as I hope is obvious. Um, Steps that universities can and should take in order to protect or express to Jewish students that they are welcome. I think um, the most significant one comes through the curriculum. And that means um, that you have enough opportunities for both uh, Jews and non-Jews to learn about uh, relevant matters in their uh, courses. Uh, and that means to learn about maybe Jewish history, but definitely Jews as they are today, uh, about um, uh, our beliefs or practices, basic understanding uh, in regards to um, what um, uh, being Jewish in the United States today means. And, you know, this can be in coursework and it can be in events or speaker series or various other um curricular and co-curricular opportunities to learn, right? Um, and the other thing that I would say is that universities need to work with Jewish students, also with organizations that represent the, uh, some of them like Hillel, but not just with the organizations, also directly with Jewish students um, wherever uh, they are found wherever they live, wherever they organize, wherever they are uh, looking to be heard, to work with them uh, to try and make changes that would support them. And this can take different forms, you know. A, in some places, people look for more um, visible protections, for example, you know, whether it's going to be security or other things. And in other places, Jewish students report that it makes them feel uncomfortable, more tense, more concerned about uh, threats. So maybe you don't need as much of that um, or not in the same way. Um, 
uh, you talk to them about their concerns. Uh, there are colleges today where, you know, it's very difficult, for example, to find a kosher meal. You know, is this a concern where you are, you know, uh, how can we fix that? Um, so, uh, you know, does the um, calendar properly recognize, I mean, all calendars nominally recognize Jewish holidays, does the calendar properly recognize that in a way that can really support um, Jews who are observant? Happy to be shot, by the way. Um, uh, so, you know, the, not that I think that has necessarily to be recognized by not allowing exams on this date, but generally um, happy holiday. So, um, right, so I think working with Jewish students, both in regards to the curriculum, uh, and in regards to uh, other activities and clubs. And also, again, going back to my general comment, uh, the boundaries of what people can uh, uh, say to and about Jews, right? Um, starting with uh, just recognizing that people get to define their own identities and it's not the university or any other authority that gets to tell us um, who is a Jew, right? Uh, I have a lot of follow-ups here, but I have one or two others that I really also wanted to touch on, and then we'll get to some audience Q&A. Again, if you have a question, click the Q&A icon down below, type in your question, make sure your name is included, and then if we select your question, we'll promote you to become a panelist and ask Seagal your question um, directly. So one of the things that I'm really curious about is um, in one of your books, you talk about this notion that college students are young and they're testing boundaries and they need to have the opportunity to kind of play with different ideas. You also start off the book with an anecdote about um, a sit-in uh, in uh, an occupation of the president's office, I think at Penn, which I just found funny because my brother was a freshman at Penn. He took part in one of those sit-ins a long time ago and was also funny. This was before sort of social media and really the internet. Um, but he was actually quoted in the student newspaper as saying something a bit crass, but kind of funny. And then that got picked up and then was quoted by um, further books that were talking about campus protest movements in a bit to the shame of our family. Um, but a question that I have is there is so much attention right now that's being paid to college campuses, right? So in some theoretical world, you have young people who are 18 to 23 ballpark, and you wanna give them kind of a, a playground where they can try on different ideas and test each other. And yet today, a student writes something in the Crimson, uh, the Harvard student newspaper, the Daily Pennsylvanian, and that's just going to get circulated around the world and picked up. Someone's going to tweet it. And all of a sudden, there's all this attention, which is being paid to what's happening on a college campus. Whereas in some previous generation, maybe someone were quoted in the student newspaper that you know wasn't online, was only read by basically the people who were on campus. And I'm curious if, if this element of, uh, of uh, the campus, the university experience is even something which continues to exist today. Um, whether we like it or not, the attention that gets paid, certainly to Harvard and I think to Penn and some other schools is just uh, enormous. And it doesn't seem as if these students actually have the opportunity to say something that they may actually change their mind about six months or a year later and to try out this idea. And is there a way that we can kind of rebuild the university as a place that there actually is a, a bit of a playground for these ideas? Wonderful. So uh, this is the real concern in my view, and it goes back also to your um, uh, uh, quick aside before about side chat and, um, you know, different online platforms, social media platforms, um, and how they impact the work that we do. I think in terms of um, you know, sit-ins and protests and the student newspaper, this train has kind of left the station. And I think students know usually what they are getting themselves into when they post something online. They know that it's um, never going away, right? And I don't think it's healthy for young people that they can be um, held to account for something that they posted or said or did when they were 14 or, or 19, 
Uh, but I think there is not much that we as universities can do about that. And that includes um, uh, in regards to protests and, and other events and efforts that are happening publicly on our campuses. Um, I do think that we need to account for that in our classes, right? So I think classes do need to be preserved as contexts in which um, uh, this process that you just described of trying on ideas, of considering different perspectives, of saying something and then changing your mind. Um, I think in the classroom, it's really important to sustain uh, our ability to do all of that. And I think, again, there are norms that you can set in class that would support that. You can say, uh, that, you know, in my class, I ask that you don't record anything that's being said um, so that people feel more comfortable talking. As it is, people, because they live on campus and they study on campus, you know, they already have the social concern about saying something that people would here in a certain way, and then it reverberates through their social networks, the, the real ones, not the virtual ones. Um, so uh, add to that the concern about the filming or disseminating in other ways. I think uh, that's really um, a cause for a lot of silence and sort of like holding back, uh, which is regrettable. So we need to set up these contexts where people will learn to trust each other and they will learn to um, allow themselves to engage in these ways. And I just want to give a quick uh, shout out to um, the SNFpedia uh, program fellows who are the students that are part of this program. It's a certificate. It's like a minor that uh, we that I'm directing and that we have for um, a civic dialogue. And the fellows in the program, the students who are doing this minor. Um, they um, participated all of last this past fall in our seminar. At the end of the seminar, the last day, they engaged in a discussion about all of the recent events on campus. And despite being very diverse in all ways, including ideologically, um, they were able to have a thoughtful, engaged, open, honest conversation about their beliefs and about their differences in a way that they all reported, or at least many of them reported, was really valuable for them because they can have their beliefs affirmed within a diverse context of different beliefs. And that is very hard, right? I was able to do that with my students who share some of my backgrounds and beliefs, you know, in a side sort of like circle, to do it uh, with diverse uh, peers is very hard. And I think we have to just be intentional and uh, committed creating and sustaining these contexts for students. Thank you, it's a great plug. I've got one final question and then we'll get to some audience questions, which has to do with university statements, which I think have gotten a lot of uh, presidents, administrators uh, in trouble. And, um, you know, you've written that it's rare that a university in terms of senior administration invites an outside speaker. And this usually happens just around commencement. Uh, but more typically, these come from departments or student groups. Uh, and it's important for the higher ups in the university not to interfere. And sort of in light of this thinking, um, I'm curious uh, what you think about the statements that university presidents have issued recently, uh, and certainly on a whole host of issues going back well before October 7th. Should they be making these? Does that in some way infringe on the freedom of other people within the university? And I think also now, you know, Stanford has uh, forsworn making such statements and it's been the longstanding policy of the University of Chicago not to. So what do you think about that either before October 7th and, and since? You know, the University of Chicago uh, commits to um, institutional neutrality as various other Vanderbilt. I mean, there are a few universities that do that more formally. Um, I think this is a, um, it's a losing fight to commit to institutional neutrality because I think um, uh, there, are, there are always gonna be events 
that happen that affect your campus directly or that even happen on your campus or that have to do, for example, with your commitment to admitting different students. I mean, there's going to be uh, world or, or national or local events that reverberate on your campus in a way that requires that you have policies or comments in response to them. So I don't... Um, uh, I don't make too much of institutional neutrality. I think um, it, it's not a feasible effort. Um, I, I, at the same time, uh, I've increasingly become, con become concerned, especially in the last few years, but uh, going further than that too, um, that universities are called on to respond to too many things that are happening in the country and around the world. And then you get into, uh, you know, two issues. First of all, why did you comment, you know, on um, the war, uh, this war, but not on the previous or another war that's happening now? Why are you expressing concerns about this and not about a similar thing that happened in a different part of the world? Um, your language was different, right? So there is, it just becomes an ongoing set of concerns um, uh, that you are supposed to respond to as an administrator, and as we've seen, revising and amending and revising against your statements. Um, but also, uh, you are finding yourself becoming, um, becoming, I don't know, boring. Because, like, people delete your emails, you know? I mean, you're just doing too many of these statements about too many things. People become jaded about them. And so... You know, when the university speaks, what should it say, right? It should say uh, something that would be meaningful, that represents its goals, that represents its efforts, uh, its mission. Uh, and I think commenting on world events, broadly speaking, should not be a part of an individual university's commitment in the same way that I think it's fairly ridiculous that various city councils are making comments about the war in uh, the Middle East right now. What business do they have doing that? So respond to what's happening on your campus, support your students and staff, but I don't think making statements about world events is the role of a university. Well, Sigal, thank you so much for so thoughtfully answering my questions. We only have a, a short few minutes for audience Q&A. We're going to turn to Gerard Bather, who will kick us off this evening. Gerard, thanks for joining. And you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prof. This is a fascinating discussion. I, I wanted to ask you uh, if you could talk a little bit about the difference in perspectives on free speech in Europe versus in the United States. My understanding is that um, in Germany in particular, uh, probably because of the background of its role in the Holocaust, uh, they have a different attitude towards free speech than we have here. Here it seems to be, you can say anything uh, you want as long as you don't uh, act you know, violently on it. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, in, um, in, in Germany uh, and maybe uh, elsewhere, uh, speech that's considered uh, uh, sort of can be considered a hate crime, even if you don't act on the, those uh, speech patterns. And I, I just wonder if there's something that you think we can learn here in the United States from uh, European law on these matters. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for this question. I think it's really important. I would say, yes, both in Germany, in Canada, and as of very recently in Australia as well, uh, there are laws that restrict hate speech. So in the United States, hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. And when people make hateful statements, they cannot be prosecuted for that. Um, uh, in the in Germany, if you post a swastika someplace, that's a crime, right? And in the US, it is not. Uh, which set of laws is better? I mean, it's for any of us to make up our own minds. My personal view is that uh, restrictions on hate speech are a, a properly aligned with democratic goals. 
So um, I do think there is something that we can learn from uh, the charter in Canada or uh, uh, some of the uh, recent laws in Australia, for example. But are, uh, is the United States going to do that? No. So, you know, the First Amendment uh, stands here in a way that uh, I don't think is open to uh, reconsideration. And therefore, right, therefore, it's institutions like uh, uh, institutions of higher learning that have to figure out a way to uh, express their perspectives and norms in a more forceful and clear way. We can say, yes, you can talk like that out on the streets. That's not how we talk, right? And we already do that about lies uh, and fabrications, as I tried to demonstrate with the flat earth and all of these things, right? We already do that. And I think there is room that we do it uh, in a clear way in these regards too. And I know it's this is, you know, uh, sending me way far on the outs of uh, anyone in this audience or uh, in my field who uh, is a constitutional law professor. I'm just gonna say I'm aware of that. This is where I stand. Gerard, thank you so much for joining for that question. Just having a little trouble promoting uh, Jason Sorgerbos question on his behalf. He uh, is an alum of the Harvard Business School. Um, and he asks what your thoughts are on the process of bringing outside speakers to campus uh, by student groups, especially those who are more incendiary uh, and, and say things that can be hurtful to uh, people on campus. Yeah, that's a really hard one. I mean, I'm very committed to um, maintaining the autonomy and the freedom to associate and to act for student clubs and organizations. I think it's a very important part of our civic mission, right? It's part of how we support students as they learn to organize and to mobilize. Um, but this is a real concern. Um, bringing hateful speakers, and it becomes even more so when some organizations on campus are being encouraged by outside groups um, or even political uh, organizations to um, get free access to their slate of speakers who are going to propagate hateful perspectives. And that's, you know, a, a real um, uh, it's it's a real set of events that we are seeing uh, in recent years. And so I think we need to figure out ways that are educational in this regard. I don't think we should restrict uh, student clubs, although uh, I think it's legitimate to say if a club is persistently not aligned with the university's goals, you can disrecognize it, right? Or unrecognize it, whatever would be the right word. Um, but for specific events and speakers, I think, you know, clubs could be required to get advisement from faculty leaders. They could be required to submit some uh, uh, justification as they do uh, or did for a while at Berkeley. Um, these are not restrictive. I mean, you know, they are edu uh, educational efforts, right? Why do you want to invite this person? Um, what are you hoping to learn from that? Who are you inviting? How are, how are you engaging the audience? All of these are, uh, in my view, completely legitimate processes to go through in an educational institution. And um, uh, we also need to maintain our commitment to educating the student body that when uh, a hateful speaker comes to campus, uh, your biggest power is your attention. Don't give it to them, right? I think oftentimes the best action that you can take is to ignore them. And this is how some of the more hateful speakers of recent years really lost their taste for coming to campuses. They had no audience. And I think that's a fairly effective tool as well, along with others. So I've got one, one follow-up question to that, which is you know, so much of the attention gets placed on either outside speakers, I think those make the news more, or protests that happen, you know, in on the college campus, we don't tend to hear so much about free speech in the actual classroom itself. And I'm curious: is free speech protected there, and students are just more comfortable with hearing things that are, uh, you know, that they may disagree with, or are people just keeping quiet? 
uh, or, or students just showing up at seminars and not talking because they're bored and haven't done the reading. I'm curious, sort of, you know, you're you're heavily involved, not just that you, you know, are a professor, but also that you're consulting. So, you know, what do you see? Are there controversies that play out there? There are a lot of controversies inside classrooms. I think we don't hear about them as much, uh, except when you have a, a more, you know, like explosive one, a professor using slurs or saying something that's really outside the bounds or some really, uh, you know, stronger disagreement among students. Normally, you, uh, unless it's the professor's speech that's in question, you don't hear about it as much. And I think it's a good thing, right? The classroom is a little bit more protected. You know, there is more room for um, uh, thoughtful disagreement if we're lucky, right? Uh, we do find that students are more silent in classrooms as compared to, for example, a decade ago. Uh, but there are classrooms with, that are more lively and more vivid still. And I think uh, we need to put more of our efforts pedagogically. I know it's not as sexy, right? But we need to figure out the way to engage students in a more um, uh, lively conversation. Uh, we do see uh, students saying something wrong or inappropriate professors sometimes taking a stance that is hurtful to students. Uh, we get a, a steady, you know, a trickle of these concerns on my campus coming from students, a professor made fun of a student for their identity or, you know, so you do have these things or even concerns about syllabi and representation on syllabi. Um, but overall, I think the classroom is slightly more protected and I would be grateful if it becomes even more so. Well, Sigal, thank you so much. Uh... For your time and your thoughtful responses to these questions and your wisdom in general you've been really working on this for a long time and certainly these have been questions that have been percolating for years but i think in the past few months uh have really come to the fore and it's uh we're greatly appreciative to have someone who has spent such time thinking about these questions uh share your wisdom with us so thank you very much thank you to one and all for joining us this evening uh, thank you to the Fridas family for sponsoring this evening's program and to the Safra Center for co-sponsoring with us. And uh, I hope to, we'll see you soon. We have some more programs that are currently in the works and you'll be receiving emails about those. Uh, but until then, I wish all of you a good night and Sigal, again, thank you so much again for joining thank us. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for being here and listening to everyone. I would love to hear any questions that I didn't get to. I'm the only person with my name around, so you can easily find me. I'm happy to hear from you. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you.